Hello everybody, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, we're, today we're continuing in our study of this uh, best-selling book, More Than a Carpenter, by Josh McDowell. Now this is part 11, uh, so we've already had 10 episodes, and uh, today we're beginning actually chapter, in, in chapter, uh, chapter 10 of the book. It's a small paperback, 128 pages, but you might wonder how we could have already talked about 20 hours about this book, and there's still more to go. It, the book is so rich of, of great information. Uh, I, I hope, if you if you're just found this video now, I hope you will go back and watch this series from the beginning. I think it'll, it'll be well worth your time. Uh, before we get started, let me ask uh, Brother Joe and Brother Ted to to say hi to everybody. Uh, Brother Joe, you want to go first? Sure, this is uh, Joe with the Sebastian Dresden channel, and my channel is uh, not so much ministry as it is fellowship and learning, and uh, really enjoying this study. Uh, and so uh, chapter 10, we're closing in on closing the, uh, finishing the book off, so uh, hopefully we'll, we'll hit some high points before the day's over, and, and uh, each and every show while they've been long and it's difficult to tune in for that length of time, I I listen back to them, uh, and I usually don't do that. The shows I do aren't that good, <laughs> but these have been, and I've learned uh, things that I'm glad I listened back. So uh, I hope you will listen if you're interested in this subject, and uh, hopefully you get something on today's show. Thanks. All right, uh, thank you, brother Ted. Say hi, please. Hi, it's Brother Ted. My channel on YouTube is God's Truth Ministries, and uh, I'm glad Luke uh, invited us to be part of this uh, Google Hangout, part of this study of More Than a Carpenter. Uh, this little book, uh, you know, which is only a little over 100 pages or so, has, is just packed with so much information that will help you uh, as a Christian to be uh, more grounded in the uh, in the, in the facts uh, surrounding Christ, the person of Christ, his claims, uh, the, the sufficiency of, of the scriptures, and uh, the, the authenticity and the, um, the verifiable facts that the Bible states historically, uh, archaeologically, uh, the manuscript evidence, um, and the historical evidence for the resurrection, the most important part, which is what we've been into. And I, I uh, agree with, with Joe and Luke that this, this study is invaluable, invaluable if you just take time to watch it, even if you have to watch it in, uh, in bits and pieces, uh, it's going to be a blessing. It has been to me. I hope you guys will stick around for it. Thanks. Okay. All right. Uh, th thank you very much. We'll begin uh, Chapter 10. What, I, what we've been doing is I just read a, a, a portion, maybe a paragraph or two, and, and then we'll uh, discuss it. So the chapter 10 t is titled, Isn't There Some Other Way? Recently at the University of Texas, a graduate student approached me and asked, quote, Why is Jesus the only way to a relationship with God? Unquote. I had shown that Jesus claimed to be the only way to God, that the testimony of the scriptures and the apostles was reliable, and that there was sufficient evidence to warrant faith in Jesus as Savior and Lord, yet he had the question, why Jesus? Isn't there some other way to a relationship with God? What about Buddha, Muhammad? Can't an individual simply live a good life? If God is such a loving God, then wouldn't he accept all people just the way they are? Hmm. That might, kind of reminds me of the point that you're uh, of the video that you post, posted yesterday, Brother Joe. Uh, you might want to uh, take an opportunity to uh, recommend that video. It was it was a very good sermon. I think it's about 45 or 50 minutes. And th the main point of the video he that he kept repeating is that. Uh, um, believe that Jesus loves you as you are, not as you should be. And this is one of the main problems with people is that they, they think that uh, we get justified by God by 
behaving and 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 uh, doing what we the things that we should do. But uh, the the main message of, of that video was that uh, wait don't don't wait to try to get your life in order. Just just know that Jesus loves you just as you are, and He will save you just as you are. And then once you establish this relationship with Jesus. At recognizing how much he loves you and you love him in return and you're trusting him for your salvation, then uh, don't be surprised if, if the Holy Spirit uh, starts changing your desires and then you end up doing the things that you should do anyway. Uh, so I thought that was a very good sermon, but that's, the, that's kind of the point of this first paragraph here is that uh, one of the points is that then wouldn't he accept all people just just the way they are? Um, Brother Joe, your thoughts on that? Yeah, and and actually, uh, God does accept us as people the way we are, and that's that's a, a, a central part of the gospel that is rarely preached. Uh, so what Luke said there just now is is uh, rarely heard, <laughs> believe it or not, because churches and institutions, uh, religions, organizations of any kind rely on their fallen nature to understand things. And the Bible says we need new sight, we need to be born again. And that means we'll, we'll, our spirit becomes alive, we're able to commune with God and see things in a new way. And one of the things that man uh, sees, th sees with a fallen nature is he, he has pride. We, we have pride. And we insist on works. We have to do something to earn our salvation. We have to do this. We need to do that. Well, it sounds like penance. It sounds like we're, we're uh, being self-deprecating. No, 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 no. That's pride. We must have pride. And without that pride, uh, we come to the cross as a child, and that's the way we need to. We need to come to God as a child, not as a proud man who's earning his way to heaven. And that's central in the gospel. And every other religion has that element. And I, we're even talking Hinduism and Buddhism. You know, they have the elements of you must do this and you must do that uh, to receive higher consciousness or, or communion with God. And, of course, our Christian and Catholic friends of all stripes uh, teach that you must do this and must do that in order to come into union with God. And uh, I'll take a quote, one of my very, probably my favorite quote, from my favorite uh, Christian historical figure, Blaise Pascal, uh, God was made, or God, okay, God made man in his own image. Now that's scriptural. God made man in his own image. Man returned the favor. <laughs> and so we see God through our vision of we are good enough to do something to earn our way to heaven. And so uh, let's not return God's favor by making him in the image of man. Back to you, Luke. Yeah, okay, thanks. Uh, the, yeah, I, I will just make a comment about that statement. Uh, God made man in his image, and when we make God in our image, in other words, we're, we try to... Um, envision or think of or, or um, describe God as, um, as, as man is. That man is uh, rigid, um, he's um, um, strict, he he's, uh, believes in the merit system, that you know you get, you get what you deserve. And, and so Man thinks God is like that, and that you know, if we're going to go to heaven, it's on the merit system. It, it can't be just that God is gracious, and, and and He'll give you salvation as a free gift. That couldn't be because man, man functions by the merit system. This is one of the biggest um, barriers, or roadblocks for people to get saved. M many people think that well, this what you're telling us is 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 it's, it's too easy, too simple. Doesn't seem right. Because people think that there's nothing that's free. You have to work for it, and you've got to earn everything in life that you get. And and even though that's a that's a truth about life and humanity, that's not the way God uh, 
uh, gives salvation. He gives it not based upon personal merit. He, get, he offers it to everyone. Well, he, none of us really truly deserve it, he, but he, yet he offers it to everyone. And so the fact that we, we can receive salvation, even though we don't deserve it, especially people have a problem with thinking that somebody else, that they, they, they can clearly see that person is definitely undeserving. The thing I've heard a lot is, are you telling me that Adolf Hitler could be receive salvation if he just believed on Jesus for it? And yes, that's what we were saying. That's what the Bible says. It doesn't matter how bad we are. Um, none, none of us are. We're all relatively good and relatively bad. Uh, no one is perfectly bad. Uh, everybody has some goodness in them. And, and certainly no one is perfectly good except God. That's the point that Jesus made. Uh, only God is good. But people think that... Uh, that we can we can judge man's goodness, uh, but it's a relative goodness comparing one man against another. But uh, God doesn't judge us based upon some kind of a grading system like 95% an A, or He doesn't even grade us based upon a curve, like you know if you're if you're just in the top tier of good people, then you're going to be okay. Uh, he 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 grade, grades us on just one thing. Did you believe on Jesus or not? So I guess I went off off subject a little bit there, but uh, Brother Ted, what's you, what's your thoughts on this so far? Well, what I was going to say just just piggybacks right on top of what Joe and then you said. You know, Joe Joe talked about you know the reason there's no other way is because um, God doesn't judge us based on a merit system. You know, and, and sometimes human nature you know does you know, uh, just naturally lean towards the merit system because that's the way we are with each other. Uh, nobody down here on earth loves anybody unconditionally, really. Uh, you know, that, that all has a stopping point. But And as you said, Luke, uh, the nature of a free gift, people people have a hard time with that. But I think uh, getting back to the, to the theme of that chapter, uh, which all this ties in with, you know, can't there be some other way other than Christ? And the thing that I thought of is, no, there can't be some other way because Jesus Christ is the only one that did it all. He's the only one that completely fulfilled the law, lived a perfect life, and, and died for our sins and took away the sins of the world. He's the only one that did that. So, um, you know, and another thing that, that makes that statement, you know, what it is, which is, you know, exclusive, narrow, and that would be hated in today's, you know, quote, you know, inclusive, you know, tolerancy mindset, is the is the reason that uh, that statement is so uh, authoritative is because, uh, and I think you mentioned this, is it's because of who he is, you know, he's the one, he's the one that. Um, uh, I lost my train of thought. Now he's the one that took away the sins of the world, but he's the reason it's authoritative. Oh, I know what I was going to say is because of verse nine. Uh, Philip asked Christ to, you know, have a bit, uh, you know, sh show us the Father. It'll it'll be sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, "Have I been with you so long and you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father?" And uh, the reason his claim is so authoritative is because he's God. And those of you who haven't watched these uh, previous videos, go back and watch them. We, we talked all about the claims of Christ and his deity, that he was truly God in the flesh, and his claims were too outrageous to be anything else unless he uh, truly was who he said he was. That's why this claim is authoritative, because of his uh, deity. And uh, that's all I have on that right now. Thanks. Back to you, Luke. Yeah, um, that, that's, a, that's an important point. The, the scripture tells us that um, only God can save. Only God is the Savior. And then over and over again, it that identifies Jesus as the Savior. It also says Jesus is God. One scripture says, uh, identifies Jesus as our great God and Savior. So uh, he can't be Savior without being God. Um, so Buddha is not God. 
He never claimed to be. Uh, Muhammad's not God. He never claimed to be either. Uh, no, no other. There might be some crazy people that over throughout history that claim to be God. Maybe you know somebody right now in your family or friends that are demented and think they're God. <laughs> but, uh, uh, and that's the question we answered early on in this book is that uh, uh, since Jesus claimed to be God, was his claim true? Or was he lying about it? Or was he a lunatic? We, we addressed that in some earlier uh, chapters. Uh, but so the, f the first point, of course, is that uh, if, if Jesus is truly God, then he's the only way to be saved because you can only be saved by, by God. Now, the other thing, of course, is that we we spent quite a bit of time showing that the, the scriptures are reliable. And the scriptures tell us that Jesus claimed that he's the only way. So if Jesus claimed to be the only way, then, then that settles it right there. But I'm sure there's much more to be said. I'll continue reading here. It says, um, um, a businessman said to me, quote, evidently you have proven that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Aren't there other ways also to relationship with God apart from Jesus? Uh, the above comments are indicative of many people's questions today about uh, why one has to trust Jesus as Savior and Lord in order to have a relationship with God and experience the forgiveness of sin. I answer the student by saying that many people don't understand the nature of God. Usually the question is, quote, how can a loving God allow a sinful individual to go to, to hell? I kind of, that question kind of surprised me. I'll, let me repeat it in. Quote, how can a loving God allow a sinful individual to go to hell? Unquote. I would ask, how can a holy, just, righteous God allow sinful individuals, uh, a, a sinful individual into his presence? Unquote. A misunderstanding of the basic nature and character of God has been the cause of so many theological and ethical problems. Most people understand God to be a loving God, and they don't go any further. The problem is that God is not only a God of love, he is also a righteous, just, and holy God. All right, well, let me get your thoughts on that, Brother Joe. Yeah, uh, Luke, you know, I, I was wondering uh, if I got us off course starting with the gospel, and now I realize why we did that. Uh, yeah, we have to understand that there is such a thing as sin. You know, uh, we easy believers, we, we grace believers, we gospel believers, we people that take the Bible for what it says, believe that we only need to believe upon Christ and who he said he was and what he said he did for salvation. But uh, it's good to know that there is a thing called sin, and there's a reason that we need a Savior, uh, because God, you know, we, we were talking about people wanting to earn their way to heaven and, and participate in paying the price to make it. Uh, that What we're doing is we're setting ourselves up as God, or as little gods, uh, being a participant in, the, uh, the, in our own salvation. But the God is... Uh, a God who, who has laws and has uh, requirements that must be met. Uh, he has order within his creation. And uh, he gave us the law of what we know as the Ten Commandments or the compass. If you've never heard of the Ten Commandments, the compass in our heart that when we hurt somebody uh, for self-gain, we instinctively know it's wrong. Uh, <clears throat> and so uh, there is something in us called sin, something that, that is a fallen nature. And, uh, and God gave us law so that we would be able to see that we have a fallen nature. Otherwise, we may be blind to it. And so somebody did have to pay the price for us, and, and it had to be God. And we have to acknowledge that God paid that price. Now, I've said many times, I don't know why. I don't understand why. I can say I do, and people gloss over this, but I don't know why 
the creator of the universe had to take on human flesh and be sacrificed in order to pay for our fallen nature. I, if I were God, I would just snap my fingers and say, okay, I'm putting you back to normal. I guess there's a thing of free will there. Uh, I don't understand it completely, but I know that God has proved himself, and we're studying this book to show that God has proved himself. And he said he had to do that, and I accept that. And uh, uh, there's a price to be paid, but he paid it, not us. And so uh, that's that's important to realize. And if you and if you believe that mankind uh, doesn't need God, or that uh, God is is uh, mistaken, saying that we are corrupt uh, beyond redemption without His sacrifice, I submit as evidence the depravity of mankind. Look around you. Walk to the store late at night. Look in the Middle East uh, at ISIS. Trust me. Uh, our fallen nature, uh, we're not utterly corrupt, but we are very corrupt. And our we have this sin within us. While we have the attributes of God, we have wonderful, beautiful things about us that God gave us because he made us in our image. We also have a fallen nature, and we're destroying ourselves daily because of that and because we haven't accepted the truth of the gospel. Uh, and I'm just rambling now. But uh, just what came to my mind. Back to you, Luke and Ted. All right. Thanks, Brother Ted. Well, after after Joe waxed so eloquently there, and I want to say amen to everything he said, uh, I've got something stupid to say. Actually, it's a question. I didn't really hear a question that you asked regarding uh, what Josh was talking about. What what exactly was your question? So I can comment. Go ahead. Well, I'm not. Uh, I don't uh, offer uh, up questions a lot of times. I just read a paragraph and ask your thoughts on it. So there really was no question, but the subject of the of the uh, this, the the paragraph was this. Now we're introduced with this problem of sin. So, uh, oh, in other words, the question is why? Why uh, can't God just, you know, even though everybody's a sinner, just uh, ignore that? Ah, okay. Okay. Well, uh, obviously, sin has been a big deal to God from the very beginning. I mean, He basically only gave uh, one thing for Adam and Eve not to do. And that was to not eat of the fruit uh, uh, of the of the tree of, of the knowledge of good and evil. So from the very beginning, uh, uh, and this is just what's coming to me, uh, sin uh, is is an affront to God because He's holy, because He's righteous. Uh, you know, there's so many people that uh, you know are against doing anything to. Any wrongdoers in our society, they're you know they're against the death penalty for murders, uh, things like that. I, I want to give extreme examples so I really drive the point home, and uh, you know, so I want to I want to ask some, somebody who's like a real liberal or whatever, uh, you know, let, uh, I ask them, well, who's important to you? They'll say, well, my mother. Okay, all right. Let's say somebody broke into your house, uh, broke into your mother's house, uh, uh, sexually molested, uh, assaulted your mother. Uh, tortured her for hours on end, and then uh, killed her very slowly. Um, you know, what do you think we should do with that guy? Do you think we should just let him go? Well, usually they'll say something like, well, they, they should just spend life in prison. Okay, well, uh, that's not the standard that God has, but let's just say, okay, but you believe in a penalty. You believe in a penalty for something. You believe that there's a right and there's a wrong. You know, if there is no God and there is no holiness, and that God doesn't have a holy standard, there really is no right or wrong. You know, If we've all evolved, and uh, uh, the, the evolutionists are right, the naturalists who just say, uh, we came from slime, nothing's wrong, really. Ultimately, when animals kill each other out in the wilderness for food or just for, for domain, for territory, or for domination, uh, or whatever, uh, that's the way it should be if you're a true naturalist, a true evolutionist. But 
God, from the very beginning, says there's standards for eating of the tree of life, I mean, uh, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the, in the book of Genesis. They were kicked out of the Garden of, of Eden, the Garden of Paradise, you know. But God's always been the one to, to rescue mankind. I mean, and when Adam and Eve uh, fell like that and they realized they were naked, God made the first sacrifice. It said he made them coats of skins to cover themselves. So God always comes to the rescue, just like he did with Abraham. God himself shall provide a lamb, etc. So uh, God is a God of holiness, and we're the ones fallen and sinful, and he's loving, loving enough to, to always rescue us if we'll let him. So back to you. Okay. Um, well, I guess we need to address Joe's question. You know, he's, well, why can't God just just snap his finger and just say, okay, I'll, I'll undo this sin and just make it how it was or something? But in a way, God did that. And that's what that's what He accomplished with this payment for man's sin. But why was that necessary? You see, you see, God. Uh, when when we studied the Bible, we learned about who God is. We 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 learn about his uh, character, his nature, uh, and, and the, there are certain things that the Bible says that describe God. And it says God is love, God is loving. Uh, and it says that God is merciful, God is gracious, but it also says God is just. And this this just justice, this is the problem. If God didn't require justice, then you know uh, he could just wink at all at, at everything, you know, and say, "Oh, everybody's sinning, so it's no problem. I'll just ignore it. I'll turn a blind eye to it." Uh, but the Bible says the wages of sin is death. Uh, so this is uh, he's going to rather than rather than uh, applying the the law that. Hey, the consequence of man's sinfulness is death. Uh, we, he just ignores it and winks at it. Or that, but then that would make God unjust. It's like the example that Brother Ted gave. Uh, and man realizes that if someone is uh, does something evil, like as he described to the woman that was, you know, t tortured, molested, and killed, that. Hardly any, you'll hardly find anybody that says, well, just let him go. It's no big deal. Ever, everybody recognizes the need for justice, and, and God, God is, is, is also just, and he requires justice. So because of his, this being a quality or characteristic of job, God is part of his, his nature, then um, how is he going to address this, the problem that man has sinned? Well, he, he could require that man pay for his sins, uh, but uh, that means that man would be uh, uh, doomed, he condemned, uh, and he'd be judged, condemned, and then sentenced to to death. And that's that is the the future of all mankind until God said, "I love them so much, I don't desire that any of them should perish." Uh, so. Uh, uh, God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So he says, I, because I love them so much, I don't want them to have to suffer the consequences. So what's the remedy? And, and, and that still allows me to be a just God. Well, someone has to pay for their sins. I'll become a man. I'll pay for their sins. And so, and of course, the scripture says there's no greater love than giving your life for, for someone else. And that's that's the greatest demonstration of love there ever was, that what Jesus did for us. So that's the reason God just couldn't just uh, you know, undo it and, or wink at it, you know, because God is just. I'll read a little further and then I'll ask you to respond to all that. It says, uh, we, we basically know God through his attributes. Well, I think that... Uh, Sounds like to me like Josh Waddell is going to go into the same kind of answer I just gave you. But uh, an, an attribute is not a part of God. I used to think that if I took all the attributes of God, holiness, love, justice, righteousness, 
and added them up, the sum total would equal God. Well, that's not true. An attribute isn't something that is a part of God, but something that is true of God. For example, when we say God is love, we don't mean that a part of God is love, but that, that love is something that is true of God. When God loves, he is simply being himself. Here is the problem that developed as a result of humanity entering into sin. God, in eternity past, decided to create man and woman. Basically, I believe that the Bible indicates he created man and woman in order to share his love and glory with them. But when Adam and Eve rebelled and went their own individual ways, sin entered the human race. At that point, individuals became sinful or separated from God. This is the predicament that God found himself in. He created men and women to share his glory with them. Yet they spurned his counsel and com command and chose to sin. And so he approached them with his love to save them. But because he is not only a loving God, but a holy, just, righteous God, his very nature would destroy any sinful individual. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. So you might say God had a problem. I guess he's going to explain more the, the answer to the problem, but uh, let me get Brother Joe's thoughts on all this. Well, <clears throat> uh, yeah, this is this is deep stuff, and, and this is uh, the deeper things of the gospel, because this all does relate to the gospel. And uh, once we accept the gospel, it says, uh, uh, seek deeper things and, and, and meditate on his word. And that, that this is the result of that. Uh, I, I'm keying in on something Ted said. He brought up the animal kingdom and, our, and uh, mankind having a, a, a difference where we, we do seek justice naturally. And uh, I, I would just like to to think for a second about, well, the law is written on our hearts. We have a sense we were given of right and wrong. So without any knowledge of God, God made us in a way that our inner compass uh, dictates what's right and wrong in that hurting others for self-gain is, is wrong, and, and you can expand from there. But we also have a sense of justice that was given to us innately. Uh, as an attribute, like one of the things that, that uh, God made us in his own image. Now, what Ted had mentioned is someone doing something horrific to a loved one, and there's a natural sense of a crying for justice in that case, a punishment of, uh, of sin. Of, and let's say you don't recognize sin. You've never heard of the Bible. You live in a tribe in uh, South Africa that uh, has been isolated from all mankind throughout the eons. They still have that sense of right and wrong, and they have that sense for a need for justice. Uh, and so <clears throat> God gave us everything we need to find him and, uh, and understand him, because within ourselves we have that, that thirst for justice, and it's a righteous thirst for justice. It seems right to us. And, uh, and so God uh, evidences himself in every man, uh, the animal kingdom has has no idea of right and wrong and, and a, a sense for a need for justice, but mankind does. And and we also uh, have uh, uh, the understanding and, and the euphoria that comes from forgiveness, even in a uh, society without any knowledge of Scripture. So all, all that God is is within us, in, in, a, in a natural sort of way. And yeah, the, these things about God are his attributes, they're not him. But we are made in his image, and we do have those attributes. And we can look heavily on that to find God. Uh, so when someone hears the gospel, there's some natural drawing, a spiritual drawing to, to that truth. Back to you. Luke. Okay, thanks. And, and Ted, your thoughts on this? Well, the first thing I thought of whenever um, Joe was going through those things is, you know, and what you were talking about, what's true of God. Uh, you know, what's true of God is uh, 
not always true of us, but the thing is what's, what's true of God is what should be true of us because we're made in his image. And uh, some thoughts I had on that were that uh, when we see, like Joe was saying, when we see justice, uh, fairness, you know, there's something that resonates within us and saying, yeah, that's right, you know, uh, something that's fair, something equity, you know. Uh, you know, we don't like cheaters. Uh, we don't like things that are unfair because there's something that God has put in us, uh, the human conscious. Uh, uh, you know, we know we know God's holy. If if we have a right view of God, we know He's forgiving. We know, uh, I think, by experience that when we experience the forgiveness of God, we feel that peace, that that joy of knowing we're forgiven, knowing God's promised us uh, forgiveness. Um, and uh, being made in his image, uh, the Bible, uh, some of the things I thought of is we have a conscience. It, the Bible says that he has written eternity on our hearts. Uh, the Bible says all through Proverbs, you know, uh, usually Proverbs, what we got in there is a lot of things, the wise versus the foolish, you know. And you really pull that down. It's, it's the way of God or the way of man choosing not to be like God, man choosing to be sinful and foolish. Uh, and then what that also Proverbs points out is uh, fulfillment or emptiness, you know, ful fulfillment or empty uh, vanity and things that don't fulfill a person and don't help their fellow man. So all these things that are attributes of God are things that he's trying to, to relate to us, to show us that, hey, I don't want you guys just to be a, a, a bunch of miserable morons mistreating each other. There's a reason I gave you my commands, the reason I gave you my word. There's reasons for these. And so you can be more like me because I'm truly, you know, just, holy, righteous, and all those attributes that, uh, that uh, Josh was talking about there. And that's the way man's fulfilled. I think one of the things that you have to put forward to people is, you know, that they, a lot of evangelicals or fundamentalists will say, you know, that verse in the Old Testament, the whole duty of man is to... Fear God and obey his commandments. Yeah, that is. That's the whole duty of man. But, you know, they forget about the new covenant and how, how God, Christ himself, fulfilled the law. But the thing is, uh, I believe, and I can't cite a particular verse, and uh, somebody's going to shoot me for this probably, but I believe God put man here so he could enjoy life. And I don't want that to sound irreverent to anybody listening, but I think God truly wants man to enjoy life and the way to enjoy him along the way is is with God and doing things God's way. I don't think he wants just just obedience that's just dead and dry. I think he truly wants to to enjoy him. And the way you enjoy him is, of course, by doing things his way. So I'll leave that there. Back to you. All right. I'll read a little further. I'm sure we'll probably talk more about the sin problem. Here is a problem that developed as a result of humanity entering into sin. God, let me see. Oh, I'm sorry, I read that paragraph. Um, so it says God had a problem. Uh, and that is that man's a sinner, God is just, therefore, but God loves man and wants a relationship with him, so there's a dilemma there. Within the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, a decision was made. Jesus, God the Son, would take up upon himself human flesh. He would become the God-man. This is described in John 1, where it says that the Word became flesh and tabernacled or, or dwelt among us. And also in Philippians 2, where it says that Christ, Jesus, emptied himself and took on the form of a man. Jesus was the God-man. Uh, he was just as much man as if he had never been God, and just as much God as if he had never been man. By his own choice, he lived a sinless life, wholly obeying the Father. The biblical declaration that, quote, the wages of sin is death, did not apply to him, because he was not only finite man, but infinite God. He had the 
infinite capacity to take upon himself the sins of the world. When he went to the cross almost 2,000 years ago, a holy, just, righteous God poured out his wrath upon his Son. And when Jesus said, quote, it is finished, unquote, the just, righteous nature of God was satisfied. You could say that at that point, God was, quote, set free, unquote, to deal with humanity in love without having to destroy a sinful individual because through Jesus' death on the cross, God's righteousness, the righteous uh, nature, was satisfied. Brother Joe? Uh, wow, yeah. Uh, you know, it, it's uh, so simple but so complicated. It's so simple to receive and accept and, and so difficult to understand if, uh, if you think about it. Uh, you know, I, I'm without words. I'm going to pass it on to Ted. Okay, thanks, Brother Ted. Well, I think that's, that's really good. I like how McDowell laid out there the fact uh, that, uh, you know, God took the initiative. You know, man was, man was the sinner. He, he was saying there, uh, God's holy and just. And Jesus became, you know, the intercessor, the, the one who was the lamb. And I look at that, you know, and, uh, you know, knowing Christendom like we do, we usually know that people tend to camp in one place or the other. There's, there's the, sometimes the cold, dry, liturgical theologians who just, you know, want to point out, you know, the legal aspect of Christ being the propitiation for our sins. And, and I mean, I do that in my studies. We, we got to point out, you know, uh, the legal aspect, the legal side of things, how a, a holy and righteous judge even a judge of a human court uh, requires uh, either payment be made, restitution, or or penalty be uh, implemented on, on the on the wrongdoer, uh, and that is all the legal aspect. But what just came to my mind thinking about that is the the love aspect of Christ. And I thought about this when McDowell was talking about God Himself who took on human flesh. And I I, I got to read Hebrews two verse fourteen. Uh, through 18 real quick it says inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood he himself likewise shared in the same uh, the King James might say partook of the same he shared in the same talking about taking on flesh and blood and it says that he that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death that is the devil and release those this is giving me chills. Who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For indeed he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Therefore in all things he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are being tempted, who are tempted. And I think, you know, you've got the legal aspect of the righteous requirements of God needing to make propitiation for sins. But then you, to me, guys, and we can't miss this. Who's ever listening to this? Please get this. We have to realize the love aspect of Christ himself. It says he partook, in this, he partook of the same, the same flesh and blood. Uh, we have in another place it says we don't have a high priest who can't relate to our inf infirmities. You know, he himself was tempted as the same points in all we are. He couldn't do that if he was on autopilot and always just, you know, God in the flesh and oh that doesn't bother me a bit. He partook of the same so he could uh, uh, relate to us and that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death. And he, that he himself suffered, being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. So I think this is a phenomenal plan of God, that God did this in Christ, taking on human flesh, and not only taking care of the legal aspect, but taking care of the loving aspect. It says in another place in Hebrews that the blood of Christ sprinkles our conscience from dead works. What else could do that but this, this great Savior? And I'm... I'm going to leave it there. Thank you, Lou. 
Mm. Well, I think it's it's uh, worth uh, exploring this point he made at the beginning of this paragraph. He said that Jesus is the God Man. He 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 emphasizes saying that he's absolutely completely God. I don't remember how he phrased it, but um, but he's completely God, and then he's completely man. And I, th this last year, I I did a lot of study and then and then teaching on our early church history, and also uh, early church uh, heresies, and also early Christian creeds. And I found it very interesting that the first few centuries of the church, uh, the main preoccupation of the church was, was trying to uh, explain the Godhead. And there was a lot of debate. I mean, we, we know what the scripture says, but how do you interpret it? And there were great debate and great arguments over it. And, but the, each one of these creeds, the, the creed of uh, the Nicene Creed, and then you had the revised Nicene Creed in Constantinople, and then finally you had the Athanasian Creed, each one built upon the other uh, in, in defining this Godhead. And the, one of the important things that was established is that he had to be absolutely God, because only God can be the Savior. And then he absolutely had to be man, because only only man could die. God can't die. Uh, so there, there were factions. Some uh, denied his deity and and, and uh, were defined him as a, as a man, a great man, but just a man. Uh, and then others, they they um, accepted his God the deity completely. But rejected his humanity, and then the problem with that, though, is that God can be the savior, but without his humanity, there's no death or resurrection. You know, they they tried to make it seem like he didn't really have a body; it was just like a, it was a, uh, not a hallucination, but a, it was not real. It was a. Uh, so this, the idea that he's fully God and fully man, these are critically important to uh, understand, and and, uh, and and the church worked it out over the first few centuries. So I really do think they did an excellent job on that. Where I, where I was greatly disappointed in the church in the second, third, fourth centuries is their uh, departing from uh, the, the free gift of salvation and making it earned through... Uh, uh, merit through uh, baptism and communion and sacraments, uh, <clears throat> but the the idea that it was paid for, as as he said here, it says that uh, um, hmm. oops, I'll move back a page here. Yeah. Said uh, so it was satisfied. God's righteous nature was satisfied. Um, I, I think also regarding sin, people. Uh, I mentioned this in my the, my first turn to talk about man's viewpoint of his sin, and and if you ask most people, do you think you're going to go to heaven, and if so, why? Almost all people, even even the majority of professing Christians, uh, they base their salvation on on personal merit on. Uh, they say, well, uh, yeah, I think I'm going to go to heaven, and the reason is because I'm, I'm a good person. Of course, the Bible says that there is no such thing as a good person. It says only God is good. And so man's, man deems himself good based on comparing himself to other men. There's a relative goodness. And it's true that I think, you know, the way we would define it is, you know, there, there are some people that are better than others. Some people are worse than, than others. But God's standard is absolute. It's not like, it's like taking a test. If you've got a 60%, you might be able to get a passing grade on the test, but it's not a very good score, even though you didn't completely fail. So uh, 
Uh, what about 95%? That's an A, but still you've missed 5%. The God standard is 100%, perfection. And that's why the Bible says in, in Romans 3.10 and also in James, it talks about how if you've even sinned one time, then it's, it, it's spoiled. Even one sin is enough to you're tainted. And I, I've, I've talked about this before. That if we considered God in heaven to be like a sin-free zone, if you, you want to go into heaven, there's a sign above the gate that says, no sin allowed. And your Ted and I are there wanting to go in. And I said, Ted, you can't get in there because I know that you've sinned thousands of times. And, and uh, you're all dejected, but then you turn to me and say, Luke, I know you sinned that one time. I'm positive you sinned once, and it says no sin. That means zero sin. You can't get in either. So even though man wants to build himself up and act like he's, he's pretty darn good compared to other people, God's standard is no sin at all allowed. That's a big problem. But thank you, Jesus. He resolved the sin problem. He paid for everybody's sin. The, you know, and people like to say, well, I know that some people sin more than others, and we all have our different proclivities of different types of sins. The sins that I've struggled with in my life may be different than Ted's and Joe's and other people. And we, but uh, it's not the type of sin. It's not the number of the sin. The fact is we've all sinned at least once, and therefore we're disqualified. But Jesus paid for all of our sins. So this, this uh, sin problem is resolved. Okay, before I read further, let me get any of your thoughts on that. Brother Joe? Yeah, uh, really, really good thoughts from you and Ted. Um, yeah, you know, it's, I would say uh, replace the word sin with poison. And, uh, you know, all of a sudden it turns from a, a strict sense or a legal sense to a moral sense or a uh, uh, self sense. You know, God says, I don't allow cancer in my body. And you know what sin is like. Uh, it starts off with a little cell, and pretty soon it multiplies. And before long, uh, you've corrupted, your, your body is corrupted. And so uh, I'm pretty sure that. Uh, the original sin, Lucifer, uh, was one of self-determination. Uh, he, he, being a creature, uh, was trying to change the nature uh, that God had created. Uh, he wanted to change the natural order uh, to suit his own sense of pride, although he wouldn't have called it pride. He would have called it a desire for self-determination. And, uh, and that's no different than man. Uh, that, that same cell, that cancer cell, was passed on to us uh, when we uh, chose to disobey what God had said would hurt us. And, uh, and, and it's grown. And look at the world today. Uh, so uh, I, I just, for, clar for clarity, uh, when you think God does not allow sin, that sounds like a stern father. But when you look at it from a godly perspective, God doesn't allow poison in our food. He, he doesn't want a cancer cell. No cancer allowed in the body of Christ. And uh, uh, we've all got the disease and, and he has the cure. We just have to reach out and accept it when he offers it. And uh, yeah, no cancer allowed in the body of Christ. Back to you. Hmm. Yeah, that's a very, very good way of, uh, of um of uh, taking that point, no sin allowed, and if you were to think of it as cancer or just any kind of, uh, let's say, contagion, uh, you can't have a contagion in a community. It spreads. So you've got to, if someone is infected, you've got to isolate them. Uh, what's it called? When you quarantine. They've got to be quarantined, and that's why a lot of people see hell as a place where they're quarantined, separated, kept away, uh, so that heaven is not spoiled with sinfulness in it. Um, uh, all right, brother, brother Ted. Well, yeah, that's the thing about uh, 
about God versus mankind, mankind being fallen. The thing is, is uh, the Almighty God is is He's all knowing, you know, uh, meaning meaning you know He knows what's good for us as mankind, uh, and He knows what isn't good for us, um, you know. And like you were saying, uh, Luke, about you know who can enter heaven and you know what heaven is is. Uh, uh, allow it's it's no sin you know no sin allowed I think is the expression used not even one uh, you know and the thing about God not wanting any sin or not allowing any sin in His presence or in His kingdom uh, is you know that doesn't make God mean <laughs> what that is that makes Him good uh, you know we've we who have been parents know what's good for our kids you know and because we know what's good. Uh, we don't want to let them do this or that because we know those things can be harmful. Those things could hurt them. Um, so you know, and as far as the thing, the part about deserving, uh, you know, there's so many people there who don't really understand the freeness of the gospel that want to say, "Are you meaning to tell me these people who accept Christ supposedly as their savior, and uh, then just you know don't live up to the commands of God and?" Don't live this way and this way, and you know, uh, like you guys said, you know, com comparing themselves with somebody else. You know, uh, you know, they'll say, "Well, those people, they they don't deserve heaven." You know, well, sir or ma'am, uh, you don't either. You don't deserve heaven either. Uh, God gives us mercy, mercy and forgiveness to get something we don't deserve to to get eternal life. You know, that's why Christ was there. Anybody who tries to add anything to Christ's finished work is saying that wasn't good enough. And it's, it boils down once again, we've talked about this before, to some kind of uh, uh, merit system. You merited eternal life by being good enough. Uh-uh. That doesn't square. And it doesn't square with the completeness of Christ's sacrifice. So uh, no one deserves heaven. Uh, and heaven is that way, pure and holy, and his kingdom is going to be that way because God's good. And I'll let you go on with this, Luke. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I've often heard it said that uh, uh, sin separated man and God because God can't be around sin. And I, I don't, I don't, I don't know of any verse really that would state it that way. If you think of one, let me know if I'm wrong. But uh, uh, I mean, obviously, our God is around sin all the time. God, God is omnipresent. God is everywhere, and, and and God is living inside me, and each one of us. The whole we're indwelled and sealed with the Holy Spirit of God, and yet we still have sin sometimes. Uh, so, and God, is, uh, someone really resent got upset with me once years ago when I said, God is even in hell. And I don't mean Jesus went down to hell, as some people believe that when he was in the tomb that he somehow was in hell. I'm talking about God is in hell right now, or in, in everywhere. God is everywhere. If he, if he is omnipresent, he is everywhere. Um, so it's not that God can't be around sin. It's, it's that I believe that he doesn't want sin as, as a contagion to contaminate heaven because he doesn't want us to be infected and contaminated by sin. He could be around it, but in eternity, he doesn't want sin there to spread as it did with Adam and Eve. We, they did it, they sinned, and then we inherited it. Everybody has it. Not only did we inherit it, but we also have practiced it quite well. Uh, I'll read a little further. Um, often I ask people the question, quote, for whom did Jesus die, unquote. And usually they reply, for me or for the world. And I'll say, yes, that's right. But for whom else did Jesus die? And usually they'll say, why, I don't know. I reply, uh, for God the Father. You see, Christ not only died for us, but he also died for the Father. This is described in Romans 3 where it talks about propitiation. Propitiation basically means satisfaction of a requirement. 
And when Christ died on the cross, he not only died for us, but he died to meet the holy and just requirements of the basic nature of God. I don't think I've ever heard it, I recall it expressed that way before. Brother Joe? Yeah, I, that's that's a, that's something I hadn't considered. I guess maybe I had, but it seems fresh now. Uh, yeah, God the Father loves us so much that he was willing to uh, uh, give part of himself to, to, uh, to redeem us. He created us for fellowship, and uh, he created us to be sons of God, uh, a little higher than the angels, <laughs> eventually. And so <clears throat> he does have a familial love for us. You know, it's, uh, you, you quoted a, a verse that I love in the Bible earlier, Luke, where, where uh, Christ said there is no greater love than to lay down his life for a friend. And not only friends, but we're family. Uh, God says that uh, we are created in his image. And I don't think there's any other creature that has ever been created that fits that bill, even uh, slightly. That's why the angels watch us with great interest. Uh, and it also says that, uh, that the angels don't have that same uh, status. So it just as uh, mind-blowing when you stop and think about it. And, and yeah, that, that's, uh, that's new to me, too. Yeah, he did. He died for the Father also. Back to you. All right, thanks. And Brother Ted, I'm not offering this in the form of a question. It's just uh, your thoughts on this. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, I was looking at, uh, I found the verse that I think that McDowell's referencing there. Uh, starting in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, uh, uh, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Uh, God set forth Christ. God says, hey, hey, here is the propitiation. Here's the satisfying sacrifice. And obviously that was to God. Uh, and, uh, you know, you were talking, Luke, earlier about, uh, I don't think, you know, you said, uh, I don't think God can, um, you know, there's many people who claim, and we've all said it, God stand, can't stand to be around sin or whatever, you know, but, uh, you know, we take, we take the Spirit of God and the Lord Himself, who lives in us, into a sin. If if we sin every day, you know, un unfortunately we're doing that with with His very presence with us. Uh, but uh, let's talk about even before that. Let's talk about Christ Himself. Christ said always, "God was with me. Um, the Father's with me. The Father's working through me. Uh, you see me working. The Father's working too." Uh, I and my father are one. That's why it's so important for us to remember, and I didn't get understand this till uh, a few years ago, is that we think that uh, you know those six hours that Christ was on the cross because of Christ's statement, uh, "My God, My God, why hast thou forsaken me?" When he's quoting Psalm 22, I think you know he's more trying to get the people, "Hey, look it up, you know, look look what I'm saying," and there may have been sure that he human experience in his uh, in his human experience there on the cross where he felt that alienation but I also think about 2 Corinthians 5:21, which has also always been a favorite verse of mine it says it's talking about the ministry of reconciliation that we as Christians are supposed to share with people it says God was in Christ doing what reconciling the world unto himself where did that happen that happened on the cross. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. And he's committed unto us that ministry of reconciliation. So, you know, like you said, Luke, God, God sees and God's omnipresent. He, he's, he can be and is everywhere at once. But God, in Christ's suffering on the cross, God was there. God was in Christ reconciling the world. So he has partaken of it. He's, uh, 
he's taking it all in in order to uh, to rescue us from from sin and death so that's my thoughts on that okay I'll read further <clears throat> an incident that took place several years ago in California illuminates what Jesus did on the cross in order to solve the problem God had in dealing with the sin of humanity. A young woman was picked up for speeding. She was ticketed and taken before the judge. The judge read off the citation and said, guilty or not guilty. Uh, the woman replied, guilty. The judge brought down the gavel and fined her $100 or 10 days. Then an amazing thing took place. The judge stood up, took off his robe, walked down around in front, took out his billfold and paid the fine. What's the explanation of this? The judge was her father. He loved his daughter, yet he was a just judge. His daughter had broken the law, and he couldn't simply say to her, because I love you so much, I forgive you. You may leave. If he had done that, he wouldn't have been a righteous judge. He wouldn't have upheld the law. But he loved his daughter so much that he was willing to take off his judicial robe and come down in front and represent her as her father and pay the fine. Brother Joe? Yeah, I, I don't think that uh, people realize the very special relationship that we have with God. Uh, we're the only creatures, creation, that uh, God breathed his own life into. Uh, and he considers us, and I don't know why, but he considers us his very own offspring. Uh, not that we are creators, we're still creatures, but we have that special and familial relationship with God. And part of the plan was that Christ would become flesh, that part of God would become man and further cement that familial relationship with him. And, uh, and I, I think if people consider how special we are to God, uh, I mean, it's quaint to say, yeah, Christ laid his life down for man. It's, it's quite another thing to consider what is involved in that and what he, the links he went to to redeem us so that we would be there for fellowship and love and learning and part of his family through eternity. Uh, it, it's, it's absolutely astonishing to stop and consider. Uh, far more than, uh, it's far more than the judge paying that hundred dollars, but uh, it, it, that's a good uh, thumbnail for sure. Back to you, Luke. Mm -hmm. All right, and uh, Brother Ted, what are your thoughts on that? Well, uh, the, the the fact of uh, you know how much the Father loves us, the, uh, I immediately thought of you know when you you know you gave that, that courtroom scenario of the uh, of the father going down and paying the uh, speeding ticket of the daughter, uh, you know um, it was obviously a crime she committed. It was, it was a way that that she sinned. It was the way she she went against the law of of, of society. The law over which her father had uh, some jurisdiction, jurisdiction there, and uh, I, my mind immediately went to Luke 15, I believe it is, where um, we always know it is the, par the parable of the of the lost son. You know, uh, the, the father though had had two sons. You know, he had the wayward son, and he had the uh, he had the conscientious legalistic <laughs> you know at least obedient outwardly and the father loved them both you know he went he went running down the down the road to meet the wayward son on his way back to enjoy fellowship again and he even went out from the banquet uh, to the to the legalistic uh, disgruntled conscientious son who, who didn't like the fact that the father has had accepted that wayward son the way he did. He says, "Listen, father said, all I have is yours. You know, uh, I, I think we need to, as Christians, sometimes 
it's sometimes it's human nature to, to, to kind of judge on the curve, to grade on the curve. But fa the Father loves uh, all all people, and He just wants them to enjoy that kind of fellowship with Him, that kind of unity with Him, and His way of doing things because He loves us so much. And um, uh, I had something else I was going to say, but I forgot. But um, uh, yeah, so back to you. Okay. Um, well, there's th this is a, uh, an example I've given many times. There's there's other illustrations that that people use to to make this point, but it's uh, I think it's a pretty good uh, illustration. Every time we try to do an illustration, uh, we're we're open to some kind of uh, Criticism. Well, it doesn't work perfectly for this reason or that, but but I think that's a, that's a pretty good uh, uh, picture of, of what's actually happened. In that, uh, now the that daughter, she could she could have refused and said, well, no, I don't want you to pay my fine. I'll I'll pay it. I can pay it myself. And that's that's what people are doing when they reject Jesus. They're they're thinking that well, we don't need Jesus to pay our fine. Some people don't think they even deserve the fine. You know, as I said, they they think that they're relatively good and they should they should go they should should be able to go before God and say, look, I'm a pretty good person. Don't you think I deserve heaven? They think much more of themselves than they should. <laughs> um, but then uh, some people understand that they. Uh, they they're not that good, and yet they feel that well, there's got to be another way. I'll do it myself. I'll remedy the situation. I'll repent of my sins. I'll join a religion. I'll follow all the rules, and and then I'll be able to once I've cleaned up myself, changed my ways, I'll then I'll be able to go before God. But the problem they don't realize is that uh, even if you were to change today, it doesn't erase the, your past sins. And even if you change today greatly, you're not going to be able to become perfect. So you'd have to be perfect from the from your birth to your last breath. Never have a bad thought. Never do a bad action. And in fact, a sins of omission means that, that every opportunity in your life you had to do good. You might you better have done it. You've never you should never have uh, it uh, passed. Uh, on every opportunity. So when you understand how, how strict, that's what Jesus and Paul uh, did very well. When they, Paul says the law is a schoolmaster, and Jesus, Jesus said that, you see, it is impossible uh, for you to, to follow the law. That's why it's impossible with man, but it is possible with God. Salvation is only possible with God because the law is so strict, it's impossible to follow it perfectly. So that's the if a person realizes that uh, it is impossible, that fi they finally reach a point of, of helplessness and hopelessness, and then they say, "Well, what can be? I need to be saved. I need to be rescued." And I think that's kind of the the, the first step for a person to realize that uh, I'm religion can't save me, Buddha can't save me, Muhammad can't save you. I do believe the Bible. Uh, and when it says Jesus is the only way, He's the only Savior, and uh, so these are the things that, when people realize that they're in a hopeless situation and no other person in history can save them, and they can't save themselves no matter how hard they try to redeem themselves, it's impossible. Then they realize that they need Jesus, and He's the only Savior. Um, I'll read it further. Uh, it says, uh, this illustration pictures to some extent what God did for us through Jesus Christ. We sinned, the Bible says, quote, the wages of sin is death, unquote. No matter how much he loved us, God had to bring down the gavel and say death because he is a righteous and just God. And yet, being a loving God, he loved us so much that he was willing to come down off 
the, the throne in the form of a, the man, Christ Jesus, and pay the price for us, he was, which was Christ's death on the cross. At this point, many people ask the question, why couldn't God just forgive? An executive of a large corporation said, my employee often, my employees often do something, uh, break something, uh, and, and I just forgive them. Then he added, are you trying to tell me I can do something that God can't do? People fail to realize that wherever there is forgiveness, there's a payment. For example, let's say my daughter breaks a lamp in my home. I'm a loving and forgiving father. So I put her on my lap and hug her and say, don't cry, honey. Daddy loves you and forgives you. Now, usually the person I tell that story to says, well, that's what God ought to do. Then I ask the question, who pays for the lamp? The fact is, I do. There's always a price for forgiveness. Let's say somebody insults you in front of others, and later you graciously say, I forgive you. Who bears the price of the insult? You do. This is what God has done. God has said, I forgive you, but he was willing to pay the price himself through the cross. I think that's another real good illustration. Brother Joe? Yeah, that, that's a, a real good illustration, Luke. Really good. Uh, I, the, the point that uh, came to mind that I'd like to make, uh, well, I got two points I'd like to make. Number one, uh, Christ said, who loves more? The, the person who is forgiven much or the person who is forgiven little? And then Christ went on to answer the question that, of course, it's the person who's been forgiven much loves more than the person who's been forgiven little. And I'll, I'll interject to that point that I don't think it's uh, a matter of uh, who is more corrupt. It's a matter of who sees their sin clearer. Uh, and the closer we are to God, the more we love God, uh, the more we're aware and see our own sin nature. And so I think he's trying to say there that it's not a degree of how many sins or what type of sins. Rather, that when we are close to God, we are very much more aware of just how sinful we really are as, as creatures in our fallen nature. And, and the other point I wanted to make real quickly is that uh, Christ came not only to pay the price for sin. Now, he did that, and, and if that were all that he would have done, then that would have, he still would have come. But he also came so that we would know him. So he made himself known. Uh, he took on human flesh. He said that to know me is to know the Father. And now throughout eternity, we have a record of Christ's life. What he thought, what he said, what he did, how he feels, how he reacts to mankind. You know, everyone, the atheists are saying, well, if God is real, why doesn't he show himself? Well, that's what he did. And, and, and he showed himself through Christ. And so that was the second reason he came, so that we may know him and know the Father through him. Back to you, Luke. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks. Uh, Brother Ted? Well, excellent point uh, by, by actually both of you. Uh, Joe, uh, start with the latter first. Joe saying, uh, you know, one of the reasons Christ came uh, was so that we may know him. I think that's so good. It kind of uh, fits in with, uh, you know, Christ, you know, partaking of our flesh and blood, you know. And I, what you said, Luke, re uh, really hit home about uh, maybe someone would refuse the judge's payment. Like if the daughter says, well, no, uh, Dad, I don't, want, I don't want you to pay for it. I'll, I'll pay for it myself. I'll go, I'll go work for it. I'll 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 put in my time and work for it. Um, you know, uh, the, the, either people either want to pay for their own sins or or rejecting the payment, saying, you know, I don't I don't need any of that. I don't need that kind of payment forgiveness. I you know, I haven't I haven't been that bad or whatever. Um, some scriptures came to my mind, and one is that 
Hebrews uh, 1 verse 3 that says, uh, talking about Christ, who the express image of his person, uh, who, oh, I'm sorry, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding by all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And I, I, I've used that with people before in my teachings. It's like that, that means he didn't need your help. He did it. He doesn't need you to help pay for it or do it yourself. Um, another verse is there, in Hebrews also in 9.26. It says, he put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. You know, Galatians 1.4 also says, uh, when he had by himself purged our sins, uh, or he gave himself for our sins, uh, that he might deliver us from this present evil world. And that goes back to what Joe was saying. He provided the forgiveness, and he did that by the sacrifice of himself, and that's in order that we can come into a relationship with God and under this new covenant, how we can really know him on these terms, no longer under the law, but under grace, and saying, wow, I can know Christ, I can know this God who totally accepts me now, and the reason I can know him so well and be so confident in him, it goes back to the payment. The payment's been made to the judge, to the Father. And now we can enter in with, uh, it says in another place, uh, maybe one of you guys can remember the verse, uh, with boldness and confidence because of what Christ has done. That's how, how much we can know him. So thank you. Hmm. Um. Well, within within this body of believers, um, there are some doctrines that we uh, we don't either absolutely agree or we agree, but there are some nuances, some some uh, slight variance in in the way we see it. And I've made numerous videos talking about uh, one one was titled. Um, universal reconciliation but not universal salvation and and the, the point of the video is basically that look uh, reconciliation has been made I mean I if we wanted to look up the word reconciliation and look at all the verses that you'd see that the verses are telling us that we are reconciled God reconciled the world it's done there when you're reconciled it means hey you're, you're you're forgiven. It's done. He paid for your sins. Sin's no longer an issue. He's cast your sins as far as the east is from the west. Uh, he'll remember your sins no more. And But then some people say, well, yeah, but that doesn't, your sins aren't forgiven unless you put your faith in him. And I, I say, I, I disagree. I, this, whether you, whether you uh, put your faith in him or not, your sins are forgiven. Uh, now, but that doesn't remedy the other problem. Uh, the, so Jesus, there, there are two problems that, that were the consequence of the fall of man. One was the problem of sin, and Jesus died on the cross, and he resolved that problem. There is no sin issue, no barrier uh, between man and God. The curtain in the temple, was uh, his death was torn from top to bottom. That curtain used to separate uh, the the holy of holies where God was from the people and and what that tearing of the temple pictures that is a picture of uh, reconciliation now sins are paid for it's no longer an issue man has access to God um, but the other problem that is left still is is the problem of life and death and that is that man is uh, man is our souls or our spirits, rather, uh, were born with a dead spirit. Adam and Eve, when they sinned, their spirit died that day. And, and genetically, this dead spirit has been passed down to all humanity. Uh, we have a living mind and soul. We have a living body, but our spirit is dead like a stump. And it, when we put our faith in Jesus, the Holy Spirit unites and quickens and brings our spirit alive now. We're connected to God, and we're we have immortal spirits now. We're, we have immortality, uh, but that dead spirit can only be brought to life, and the immortality, eternal life, 
it only happens by the uniting of God's Spirit, and that only happens when we put our faith in the Savior. So that's the thing that's left to be done. That's the decision everybody has to make. Do you want to be born again? Do you want your spirit brought to life? Do you want to receive the gift of immortality? The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. So eternal life is a gift God is offering everyone, and you receive it through Jesus Christ. So that's that's the uh, question uh, that we need to ask everybody in closing here. But before I make that point com more completely, uh, I just want to ask each of you to give any summary thoughts on the study. This is the end of that chapter. Now we have chapter 11, the final chapter remaining. We might be able to do that in one, maybe two studies. So we're nearing the end of this, but for today's study, Brother Joe, could you give me any, any uh any highlights or any thoughts you have on this? Yeah. Uh, the one thing that, that comes to mind is that uh, light came into the world, according to the first chapter of John, and men preferred darkness. And so when you're, when you're talking about accepting the gospel, accepting Christ, uh, you're talking about preferring light to darkness and of course we all have a fallen nature and so uh, we're in darkness and when we see the light uh, we are judged by how we respond to that light uh, if we respond by saying I want the light then God did die Christ did die for the sins of the whole world the, the antidote to the cancer is on the table but when you have cancer you you have sympathy, you have pity, you have uh, people doting on you, you have uh, lots of really good drugs that make you feel good in an unnatural way. There's all kinds of things that that draw us to stay sick. Uh, and, and sometimes people prefer the sickness to, to, the, to the cure. And I think all mankind is, is uh, without excuse because the light is there. Uh, through the gospel, through our innate uh, conscience, and through the light that God has given to mankind. And uh, so uh, how we respond to the light is how we are judged. And in and, and, and the degree that the light is given, we are also a judge. So, you know, if you... Uh, there's all kinds of motivations to not go to the light. There's all kinds of motivation not to take the remedy, not to accept uh, the cure to your disease. And we all know people like that, you know, given the choice between uh, studying for school or partying at night, we, you know, are naturally inclined to do what's easiest. <clears throat> uh, electricity is a good example. Uh, it flows in the direction of least resistance, and uh, that's man's nature right now. And so uh, I think we need, God wants us and demands of us to respond to the light he gives us. And we certainly have the choice not to. And uh, sadly, the vast majority of mankind prefer darkness to the light and, and uh, choose self uh, over selfless. In, in regards to our, our own determination, self-determination, or God's determination. And I hope that's not uh, too esoteric, but those are my thoughts. Thanks, Lou. And you brought some esotericism, or whatever it is, in, into this. <laughs> Brother Ted? Well, I, I agree with that uh, esoteric uh, train of thought there from Joe. Um, you know, the men that reject the light are, are because they, they love the darkness. And, um, you know, uh, getting back to what you, you were asking, Luke, about the high points of the study, I would just say that, um, you know, the way it started, I think the chapter started out about Jesus being the only way. And uh, only a wise God could, uh, you know, people talk about, you know, I've tried to steer away from the plan, the words, the plan of salvation. Uh, I, I, I prefer to use maybe the maybe we should say the way of salvation, you know, 
uh, Christ, you know, what he said himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And uh, this is what's, this is something God initiated. This is, we talked about uh, the way of salvation. And we talked about Christ being the only way, which was the question put forth, I think, in the beginning of that chapter, Luke. But um, then you talked about the attributes of God, and I thought that was another high, high point. And Josh McDowell pointed out how the attributes are, of God is what's true about God. And what's true about God is that he wanted to send Christ. Uh, there's, there's verses that, that say, um, you know, Christ was crucified from before the foundation of the world, or something to that extent. God already had his plan in advance to, to rescue humanity, <laughs> uh, knowing someone would stumble. If I, you know, people who want to blame just Adam and Eve, if it wouldn't have been them, it would have been one of us. Uh, you know, so we don't have a, we don't have a right to, to point our finger at them or anybody else. Um, but God providing this way of salvation, and then God's attributes being loving, uh, forgiving, holy, just, all these things, he put all that in Christ so that we could have everything, sanctification, redemption, wisdom, holiness, forgiveness, an abundant life. It's all in Christ. And like Joe pointed out earlier in the, in the discussion time, we get to know this, this good, loving God. So this is really, I, this is one of my favorite chapters that we've studied uh, so far in the book. I, I, I say that, they keep getting better. I think I say that every week, but uh, this is really good. And we, we not only understand the way of salvation, but the loving God who provided it for us in, in the Savior, Jesus. So back to you. Yeah. All right. Uh, the... Yeah, I, I'm glad you brought us back to the beginning of the chapter when it was the question was uh, why is there only one way? Is there truly only one way? And uh, we did we we discussed that. And, and but but to me the bottom line is uh, if Jesus says there's only one way, then that settles it. So what you can do is some people react well that's unfair. It's not right that there's only one way. And other people like us react, thank you, Jesus, for providing a way. <laughs> but if you want to be stubborn and insist that it's unfair that there's only one way, and, or if you think that, hey, it's not true, there's other ways, well, that's the decision you're going to have to make. But what we've done throughout this study is proven, I think, that uh, the Bible is, you know, has been preserved. The manuscript evidence shows that it is trustworthy and it's it's correct uh, historically and 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 that uh, uh, and and that we can trust it and and the, according to Jesus is the only way to get to get to heaven. So what will you do with that? Um, the um, the idea that Brother Joe was talking about the a disease and a, and a cure is uh, if we if we look at this issue. So the good news is that your your sins are paid for. Jesus paid for your sins. So now you you're reconciled with God. Now you're in a position where you can receive eternal life if that's what you want. The question is, do you want to go to heaven? I mean, there are some people that say, "Oh, I want to go to hell where all my friends are going to be," but I've got bad news for you. The party in hell was canceled due to the fire. So uh, let's be realistic here. Hell is not a desirable place to go. Um, it's a lake of fire. The Bible says it's a second death. It says that you perish. So um, the other place, the other option, of course, is uh, what the Bible calls the new heavens and the new earth. And the description of it is, is beautiful. It's, it says, there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. It says, all the old things have passed away. Everything is made new. There will be joy and bliss and happiness forever and ever. And if that's something you want, the good news is that it's offered to you as a gift from Jesus Christ. Only from Jesus. 
You can't get it from Buddha or Muhammad or the Pope or the Virgin Mary. You can't work hard at religion and earn it for yourself. You need Jesus to receive it. He's offering it to you freely right now. Kind of like uh, eternal life, okay? Why do you need life? Well, it's because you have death. You, 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 the future that waits for you is the second death. You are mortal and your future is the second death. But there's a cure for it. The cure is the gift Jesus offers you, eternal life. Uh, it's, not a, it's not forced upon you. It's offered. So uh, you should be really, really happy because uh, this cure to death and eternal life is, uh, is available. The Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever means it, any person without exception. It doesn't matter if you've sinned more than other people. If you think, well, I've sinned so much, there's no hope for me. No, whosoever. It doesn't matter if you have some peculiar types of sins. Maybe you think the type of sin that you've done is so horrible. No, the Bible says whosoever. So if you're a, one of these whosoever's and you want this eternal life, then just call on the name of the Lord. Say, Jesus, save me. Be, be my Savior. I'm going to depend on you. That's what salvation, faith in Jesus means. It means that you, you're you believing his promise. He promises you eternal life in heaven. He says he's preparing a place for you. And this is a promise from Jesus. Believe his promise is true. Believe you indeed will have eternal life in the new heavens and new earth. Because Jesus promised it to you, and he's faithful to keep that promise. And once you believe it, you receive it. All right, brothers, uh, thanks for participating again today. I look forward to the next one. Uh, I'll give you just any last word, Brother Joe. Yeah, I I, uh, I was thinking about what Ted said. This is his favorite chapter, and I'm thinking, well, yesterday was a really good chapter. And then there was that one a few days, a few times ago. But, you know, this is the best chapter here. Uh, it focuses on uh, on the basics of salvation. And uh, we had a good opportunity to, to put out uh, uh, some our thoughts and, and uh, some detail on what salvation is. So this is, this is a chapter that was kind of dedicated to uh, the basics of salvation. And so I guess it's my, uh, my favorite chapter so far also. Back to you, Luke. All right. Thank you, Brother, and uh, Brother Ted. Well, yeah, I think, uh, I think the book is uh, culminating in, uh, in the reason that McDowell wrote it, and that was to show that Christ, you know, is more than a carpenter. He's, he's the Savior. He is the way to have eternal life. And uh, God, uh, you know, just as you said, Luke, in your, your gospel presentation there, God... God has made the way, and he wants to save us, and he wants to save just whosoever will. Uh, we'll call on him and just believe the good news, and that's that's what it is. This is what Christ has done, and I'm glad, uh, I'm glad we had a chance in this chapter today to, to emphasize uh, and put the focus on uh, where it should be in all apologetics and all these things. It should be right on Christ, and I think that's, that's what you did today. Thanks, brother. Well... I'm glad you said that. He's more than a carpenter. It is the, the title of the book. If anybody has came in late and you're wondering what we're talking about, More Than a Carpenter by Josh McDowell. So I, I think it is worth saying that uh, he's, he's not only more than a carpenter, he's more than a prophet. He's more than a great moral and religious teacher. He, he is eternal God Almighty who came down from heaven, God, manifest in the flesh as the Son of God, Jesus Christ, our great Savior God. He died for the sins of the world, and he was raised from the dead bodily as, as a sign to prove he is God and Savior. So if you're wondering, well, why should I believe this? Because of the resurrection. The last few studies we've done was a great depth talking about the resurrection. The resurrection is the sign that gives us confidence. Our faith is not in vain. All right, brothers. Thank you, and I'll look forward to next time. 
Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.